welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Luke Cobray. I'm excited for what God's got in store for us tonight. Are you ready to get into the word of the Lord? Amen. Well, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to get down on my knees and go before the Lord in prayer. If you're, if you're able to stand, would you join me as we go before the Lord in prayer and honoring and reverencing the Lord? And Father, we come before you today and we're just so grateful for the opportunity that we have to come into the house of the Lord. God, we just thank you that, that we don't take this for granted, Lord. We don't come into this place to hear from a man or to hear from a woman. God, we don't come to church for entertainment, but Lord, we come into this place to hear from you. And we fully acknowledge that Jesus Christ is a senior leader of this church. And so, Lord, it's in your name, Jesus' name, that we ask that your Holy Spirit speak to us and minister to us today. Lord, to remind us of things and to, to set things into our hearts. Lord, I ask that you would open our eyes to see and our ears to hear the word as we would hear it today. Lord, that it would be a seed that is planted into good ground in our hearts as we leave this place, that we would bear much fruit for the kingdom of God. And Lord, we thank you for all the churches all across the world and all around the Inland Empire that are preaching and teaching the wonderful gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, at no time do we think of ourselves as better than anybody else, but as co-laborers in the body of Christ, all working together to build and strengthen the kingdom of God. And Lord, we glorify you, Father. We thank you for our Catholic brothers and sisters and our Baptist brothers and sisters, our Methodist and Presbyterian and Episcopalian brothers and sisters, and our Evangelical brothers and sisters, and our Lutheran and Presbyterians. Father, I thank you for our uh, seven-day Adventist. Lord, I ask that you set your hand upon uh, Harvest Christian Fellowship. Lord, I ask that you set your hand upon Sandals and on the Grove and Ecclesia, Inland Christian, Emmanuel Baptist. Lord, I thank you for for uh, Trinity, Lord, and, and for Abundant Living and, and Crossroads Christian Center and Oak Valley and all the churches all around the world and all around the Inland Empire today that are hearing and teaching the Word of God. We glorify you that we are all many members of one body, that is the body of Christ coming together to grow and to strengthen and to build into the kingdom of God. And Lord, we glorify you and we thank you for it. We magnify you in this place today. In Jesus' mighty name, and we all said, Amen. Amen. I had to get on my knees kind of different today. I, I broke my pinky toe on Wednesday. Something that small should never hurt as much as it does. Does, does anybody ever, have anybody ever had an extremity like that? It's just like, come on, know your place. Well, I'm excited for what God's got in store for us tonight. We're going to resume. Uh, we've been doing a series here. How many of you guys have been getting something out of Sunday nights uh, here at the Rock Church and World Outreach Center? Man, I'll tell you, it's just been great. What we've decided to do is to not just take Easter and celebrate that on Easter Sunday, but rather to celebrate a, a month long of Easter. And so what we've been doing, if you're just joining us, is we've been uh, uh, teaching a series for, on Sunday nights uh, titled He Lives. And tonight is the third part, the final installment of the He Lives series here at the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. And I just know that God's got something great and mighty in store for us tonight. If you didn't grab uh, a hold of part number one or part number two, Pastor Dan and, pa Pastor Dan and Pastor Jim brought uh, uh, amazing messages. You can grab those online at rockchurch.com, or you can grab the CD uh, at the CD counter. I encourage you, they'll, they'll strengthen, they'll build you up, they'll just encourage you, you'll, you won't be the same after hearing the messages, I'll tell you what, but I'm excited for what God's got in store. So if you've got your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Hebrews. If, you're, if, you're, if you've been joining us uh, here on the weekend service, as we go through the book of Hebrews, line upon line, precept upon precept, and there's just such a wealth of information. Today we're going to find ourselves in Hebrews in the seventh chapter, I, I have confident expectation that we'll actually be getting there relatively quickly. We have been moving, and we find ourselves today in the Hebrews, the sixth chapter, starting today. But now we look at uh, Hebrews into the seventh chapter. Now we'll, we'll find ourselves maybe within this year, uh, uh, sometime in the next few months, uh, 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 Lord willing, that we'll get through to Hebrews. And I'll tell you what, it's just been such a great and wealth of information. But here in Hebrews, we're talking about the subject of He Lives, talking about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and, the, and, the, and the, the majesty behind Jesus. You know, the beautiful thing about Jesus is that he lives. You could, that's a message in itself if you think about it. Every other religion, every other uh, a social or, or, or religious thought, if, I guess if you could say it like that, is based off of somebody who came, who taught a message, and died. But Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, lives today. He died and on the third day on that Easter Sunday. We, we celebrate the resurrection on that third day from the crucifixion. Jesus rose from the dead. 
Hallelujah. And he ministered to his disciples. He ministered to the multitudes. And he left them with some amazing final thoughts. And then he went to take his place in heaven with God. And he, there he is at the right hand of God today. And I'm excited for what we've got in store for tonight's message. He lives part three in Hebrews, the seventh chapter. And Hebrews in the seventh chapter is talking about the subject of priesthood. Now, we're going to look at this. Now, I know that the subject of priesthood to you and I doesn't ring a bell, so to speak, because you and I don't live in a time where we have a high priest as our representation. But we'll take a look in just a little bit about some things that we can compare or some similar traits in our day and age that we can look at and compare to. But they're talking about, in Hebrews, the seventh chapter, is talking about the subject of Jesus Christ, the great high priest. And in Hebrews, the seventh chapter, Hebrews in the seventh chapter, verse number 23, it says this. Also, Hebrews 7, 23, also there were many priests because they were prevented by death from continuing. Verse number 23 says, there were many high priests in the span of, of, of from the Old Testament to the New Testament to the time of Jesus Christ. There were many high priests. Why? Because you and I are, the Bible tells us that it is appointed for man to die. Nobody has yet found that fountain of youth that they, they, they talk about the movies, that, you know, they talk about in the movies. Nobody has, has found the pill or, or been able to freeze themselves and come back thousands or millions of years later. There's no time machines. That's not, it, it is appointed for man to die. And so because of the limitations of mortal man, because of the limitations of man on our own, we have had many high priests, or there have been many high priests or represent, representatives of God to the people. But look what it goes on to say. Verse number 24, Hebrews in the seventh chapter, verse number 20, 24. But he, speaking of Jesus Christ, but he, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. In verse number 25, therefore he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. So here we're talking about a compare and a contrast thought out of Hebrews. Here the, the author of Hebrews paints a picture for you and I, the readers and, and those he's, he's writing this letter to. And he says there, there were representations of, of God to man in the form of high priests. And there were many of them through the generations. But they were all limited by the fact that they were man. Goes on to say further in, in the, in the book of Hebrews, that, that they were also limited in the fact that they had to make sacrifices and atonements for their sin because they were also imperfect. But now all of a sudden in verse, let's put verse number 24 back on. It says to us that Jesus, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. An unchangeable priesthood. And then verse number 25 goes on to say that he is able to save to the uttermost. To those who come to God through him, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And he said, and no man goes to the Father except through him. So we know that Jesus is the way to get to God, and he becomes our representation to God. He becomes our great high priest, and he stays forever. And now the Bible tells us that he lives always, or he always lives to make intercession. For them, for us, the people that come to God by way of Jesus Christ, the only way we can come. So today I want to take some look, take a look at some of the thoughts out of Hebrews in the seventh chapter in the 23rd, 24th, and 25th verse. And take a look at some of the thoughts, and we're talking about this subject of he lives. Now I'm gonna say this statement because he lives, and then we'll we'll complete that statement with three simple points out of these verses tonight. So we're looking at the idea and the subject of he lives. And I mean, I, 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 as we leave tonight, I, I pray that you be encouraged by the word of the Lord. I know that it's a good word that's in season, but I, I'm excited for what God's got in store because as I was preparing this, I know that the hand of God is on this and I myself was strengthened and encouraged as I was preparing this message. And so I know you will as well as we talk about because he, Jesus Christ, our Lord and precious Savior, Jesus Christ, because he lives, number one, he is, because he lives, he is our once and for all. He is our once and for all. You know, 
The people in the, in the Old Testament times and the people in the time of Jesus looked to a high priest to be their representation to God. When people wanted to find God, they went to the high priest. They went to the, to the place of the priest. The priest was the representation. He wore the clothes, he wore the, 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 the linen, and he wore the things that God had prescribed for him to wear. He had a, a status or a symbol that you could recognize him in a crowd. He didn't just look like somebody out of the ordinary. He stood out. He looked as, as one of royalty. And he stood in a position of great authority because he truly was the representation of God to the people. Going back to the time of Moses in the Exodus, when Moses was going before Pharaoh, Moses, when God had called uh, uh, Moses to go before Pharaoh, Moses told God, if you recall the story, God, I can't speak. I'm not a good person. That, that I have a problem with speech. And God said, don't worry. Aaron will do the, do the speaking for you. Aaron will be the mouthpiece for you. And Aaron becomes the, the first high priest or the first in the priestly line as the representation speaking on behalf of God to the people and for the people. And so the people looked to a man, but we read that, 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 that the man was limited because they, they died. And so they looked to a man to find God. But much like you and I, how we don't necessarily relate to a high priest, how about this though, we do relate to men to find things in our lives. We have uh, uh, politicians. For example, we have a president. And the president is, is limited to eight years in office. So every four years or every eight years, depending on the outcome of the elections, we look to a new man. And when that man comes, that man leads and does things the way they want to do things. How about this? We just witnessed history in the making a few weeks ago and last week when, when Pope Benedict resigned or relinquished his position as the Pope. And now, we, uh, last week they elected or they, they chose, the, the Catholics chose a new Pope for them, Pope Francis. And now this Pope, in his first speech, you could hear it was all about the buzz in the media, how this Pope is different than that Pope, and how this Pope is different, and he's, he's more humble than, than this, and, and his, his emphasis in life was here. And you see, when we look to a man, it's an always changing thing. Doesn't matter, you know, the Pope, we were talking about this. Some people say that the President of the United States is one of the most influential or the most influential man in the world. But I want to tell you something. I firmly believe, along with what we were discussing, that the Pope is the most influential man in the world because he has 1.2 billion followers that follow him. But we look, the, the, we look to a man as the answer. We look to a man to show us our connection with God. And what's the answer? What do we do? How do we handle this? But the fact of the matter is, is that men are limited in our lives. Our leaders are limited in their span of leadership, and they will change. But Jesus Christ is our once and for all. Jesus Christ came, and because he lives, he is our once and for all. Let's look at what it says in Hebrews in the 7th chapter, going back to Hebrews in the 7th chapter, verse number 24, it says, but he, Jesus Christ, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. You see, now that Jesus has resurrected when he died and resurrected and rose and ascended on high and is now seated at the right hand of the Father, he has an unchangeable priesthood, that priesthood being the representation. Jesus came and became our representation to God. And it is an unchangeable. We don't have to worry about, well, what happens in 10 years? And what is, what is the attitude of, of Christianity? Or what is the look of my walk with God going to look like as this leader steps up or as this leader steps up? You know, the, the, the truth is, is that men come and go. There will be a time. You sat under Pastor Jim. There will be a time when Pastor Jim is no longer with us. There will be a time when I'm no longer here. There will be a time when my children are no longer here. There will be a time when you're no longer here. And your children, or your parents, or your family members. Why? Because we are destined to die. It is, it is appointed for man, but Jesus Christ is our once and for all. There is no change. You think about it like this. 
Maybe there's been, maybe you can relate in a sense like this. Maybe you knew somebody or you, you would frequent a, a restaurant or, or a coffee shop or a market or something like that. And you, you, you knew it, you knew there was a friend or somebody. I remember there was, I had a friend that, that was a manager of a fast food chain. Or actually it wasn't really a fast food chain, but it was a, one of those, you know, you, assembly line ones where you get the burritos and you go down the line. And he was the manager of that chain. And, and after a while, I, I I began to get this connection, and I would kind of, I didn't, I don't like special treatment, but every time we'd go in there, I kept telling him, no, no, I don't want any, and he'd pay for my burrito. Oh, stop it. Stop it. I, I'm just, I'm a normal guy. You just let me buy my own burrito. But you kind of get used to it. You kind of, okay, this is kind of nice. I'll, I'll take that discount. You know that, you know the guy behind the, 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 the counter at the coffee store, or you know that friend at the, whatever it might be, you, you got that connection. You, you know, you, I know somebody, right? But then what happens? There's that statement. You kind of wonder, well, when is this going to end? When is this going to stop? You know, th th that statement, you've heard it before. All good things must what? Come to, an end. Come to an end. So you go to the store and say, wow, I love this. This is great. This is wonderful. I love that connection. I love that free coffee. I love that free burrito. But don't you know there was a time when I went back to that, to that restaurant and he had moved to another food chain and he was no longer there. And the manager that was now there didn't know who I was. And so when I kind of looked at him like, hey, <laughs> they just handed me the, the bill. <laughs> and so we have that mentality of, oh, this is good, this is good. This, 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 this life that we live is, oh, I, I've got Jesus and it's good, but when is it going to end? But with Jesus, he's our once and for all. You see, Jesus is our once and for all. all. All good things must come to an end except Jesus. Why? He lives. Because he lives. So Jesus is our once and for all. Pastor Jim was talking about repentance today from, from good works. In our very, uh, or from dead works. In our very essence, mankind, we are a change nature. How you are today is not how you will be tomorrow. What you're doing in business today will probably not be what you're doing in business tomorrow. You will evolve, you will change, you will continually adapt. My, my brother-in-law and I were talking about it. He bought what he thought was his dream home. And I was, I was kind of telling him, like, you know, he kind of bought what I thought was my dream home too. And so I, we were talking and he was kind of complaining about his home. And I was like, dude, you have a home that people stop when it's sunset, in the middle of the road, get out of the car and take pictures of your house. And you're complaining about your house? And I told him, I said, you know what the thing is, is that you got into this thing and you really liked it. But as your needs progressed, you realize, well, I want a bigger yard for my kids to play. Or I, I want to enjoy this part. Or I want to do this. And I said, we're going to continually change. You're going to move into another home. And you're going to think that that's the home. You're going to think that that's it. That I, I'm good. And then in five or ten years, your needs are going to change again. And then again, again, and again, and again. But Jesus Christ is our great high priest. Jesus Christ has an unchanging priesthood. This relationship that we live will continually change. But why? Because Jesus is our great high priest. Because he doesn't change. Our change only gets for the better as we grow in our relationships with Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us, and I'll just put it up on the overhead. The Bible tells us in Hebrews, the 13th chapter, this. Verse number 8, that Jesus Christ, a name above all names, Jesus Christ is the same today, yesterday, and that's it. Jesus Christ is the same today, yesterday, next week. The same yesterday, today, for the rest of 2013. There's the same yesterday, today, and while the economy is bad and we're looking for him, he's the same. No, Jesus Christ is the same. What? Yesterday, today, and forever. He is our great high priest, an unchanging priest. Why? Because he lives. He conquered the final battle of life, the one that nobody else could, death. And because he overcame death, made a spectacle of what Satan and the enemy had thought they had victory, the Bible tells us that he made a spectacle of it, he is unchanging, the same yesterday, today, and forever. 
And so while we go through the highs and the lows of life, and so while we go through the ups and the downs of business and of finance and economics, so while we go through the ins and the outs of, of relationships, and we're ever changing, and our thought process is ever evolving, and our lives seem to never stand still, you and I have a cornerstone, a solid rock, a foundation, Jesus Christ, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever, who is our great high priest, our representation that is unchanging, so you and I can go through all the phases of life we want. Jesus Christ is our one and only. And if we focus on business, if we focus solely on family, or if we focus to find our meaning in relationships, or from men or from women, a focus to find our identity in those things, we are destined to change. But when we focus to find our identity, our representation, who we are, the Bible says, through, uh, uh, those who come to God through Christ, when we find out and realize that we are in Christ, it doesn't matter what the changes of life are because now we know that the foundation on which we stand is one built on solid rock like Jesus told Peter, upon this rock. I will build my church. Hey, did you know something? Did you know something? This is just an address. You are the church. And Jesus says, upon this rock, I will build my church. You and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Jesus, our great high priest, amen. Praise God. Because he lives, number two, because he lives, Jesus is our great high priest. Because he lives, number two, he is able to save. I love that word, able. 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 It's an action word. Are you able to bench press 700 pounds? Are you able to leap a, a, an entire building in a single mound? Hey, are you able to save mankind? Jesus is. Jesus is able to save. There's an ability there. And there's an ability there. Why? He is able because he lives. Think about it like this. The ability of Christ because he lives. If Jesus would have came and been the propitiation for our sins and the sacrifice for our sins and died on the cross and stayed there? An innocent man dying for the sins of a guilty man? That would have been a tragic victory. That would have been forgotten in the records of history because it's been done before. I remember there's this movie that I, that I watched. Uh, I see it, it's on TV every once in a while. Tom Hanks and Steven Spielberg did it. It was a war movie. And there was this, this uh, group of, of, uh, of uh, army rangers that, that were sent on a mission to find a private somewhere deep inside of occupied Germany. And they went on this mission and they, they finally caught up at the end of the movie with this young man and his, his brothers had all died. And, and they caught up with this young man and their mission was to find him and bring him back. But this man says, I'm not going to leave my troops. I'm not going to leave my, my fellow soldiers. This is our mission. We're going to hold this bridge. And so they said, okay, let's fortify the place. And they, it, it, the, the movie goes on and the, the Germans come and, and, and everybody dies. And at the end of the movie, the, the, the captain that was responsible for the, for the life of this young, this young private, as he's breathing his last breath, being wounded mortally, looks to this young private and he says to him, earn this. If you remember the movie, if you've ever seen that, then the, 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 the private's face is shocked from that statement and then his face morphs to where now he's an old man standing over the captain's grave. And he looks to his wife with sorrow in his, in his eyes and with guilt in his heart and he looks to his wife and he falls to his knees and he says, tell me, tell me I lived a good life. Tell me I lived a life worth of saving. Tell me I was worth saving. And his wife comforts and consoles him. If Jesus came and said, I died on the cross, earn this. Where would have been the victory? We would have carried this guilt and this weight and this sorrow. But no, Jesus has the ability to save. Why? 
because he died on the cross. But three days later, he rose from the dead. He rose from the dead and he made a public spectacle of death, dragging it through the streets, shouting it from the mountaintop. The disciples 2,000 years later preserved in the word of God. We preach it, we live it, we believe it. Why? Because he is able to save. Why? Because he lives. In Hebrews, in the 7th chapter, verse number 25, it says, Therefore he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him. To the uttermost. Do you know what that means? There aren't limitations based on Jesus' salvation. He's not limited by gravity. He's not limited by time zones. He's not limited by age. He's not limited by lack of communication. He's not limited. Why? Because he lives. But I want to present a thought to you. Jesus is not bound by limitations in 1 Peter the third chapter, verse number 18. We'll put it up on the screen. For Christ also suffered once for sins. The just for the unjust. That he might bring us to God being put to death in the flesh but made alive in the what? Spirit. By the Spirit. Made alive by the Spirit. In our day and age, doctors have revived people who have died. You've seen it on the movies. You've seen, you've seen the, the ER and the different, you know, uh, different movies and TV shows. And they rub the little things together and clear. You know, clear. And pulse comes back. You've seen that. We've seen great ministers. From, from our day and age all the way through to the time of history that have had the, the gift of faith upon them to go and people have rose from the dead. We've seen it in the disciples when, when Peter rose, Tabitha from the dead. We've seen it from Jesus when he called Lazarus out from the grave. Lazarus! Come forth! But here's the thought. He was Killed in the flesh. But who stood at his grave and said, Jesus, come forth? No man, no man, but the Spirit of God, the power of God inside Jesus Christ brought him. He was raised from the dead by the Spirit. Of God, no one, no one, no one has ever done that. And no one ever will. Because we talked about it. He's our once and for all. Jesus did what nobody could do. And because he did what nobody could do, the Bible tells us he's the name above all other names. The Bible tells us he's the power above all other powers. of The things in this world and things to come, the things that are named and the things that aren't even named. It doesn't matter what science says. It doesn't matter how big the universe is. Guess what? God is bigger. And Jesus, because he was made alive by the Spirit of God, is bigger than all of that. The earth is his footstool. All because he lives. He is able to save. And he has given you and I the gift, the privilege to be in the family, to be made so that you and I could be the representations of Jesus Christ, who is our representation to God, to those who are lost and dying, so that we could share the love of Jesus Christ to the lost and dying world, so that they would find that Jesus Christ is able to save. Not us. Hey, nobody gets saved because somebody says good things during an altar call. They get saved by the goodness of God, the Bible says it. That draws men to repentance. Why? It's the presence and the power of God. The same presence and the power of God that raised Jesus Christ from the dead is the same presence and power of God that saves us to the uttermost. Because he lives. Amen? One more, and this is, this is my favorite. This is my favorite. We already knew this was coming. We knew this one was coming. And this is my favorite. Number three today, because he lives, number three today, because he lives, he is our mediator. 
He is our mediator. The Bible says in Hebrews, the seventh chapter, therefore he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. Speaking of those who come to, Christ, to God through him. He may, lives to make intercession for us. You think about this. Think of, you know, there are statements in the Bible that oftentimes we read over these verses. We read through them and, oh, they're good. Praise God. Hallelujah. But there's a gravity to them. There's, there's a weight. You know, you know what I'm saying when I say that there's a gravity to it? There's, there's something about it. It's huge. Think about this. Not only did Jesus Christ take your sins upon the cross and die, not only did he take them upon the cross and die and raise, not only did he take them upon the cross and die and raise from the dead, but then he ascended to heaven, and there he is in heaven. And guess what? He didn't forget about you there. But now he lives to make intercession for you. The word intercession means this. The action of intervening on behalf of of another, to entreat or to ask earnestly on behalf of somebody else. So imagine this, Jesus Christ, seated in heaven, your and my mediator. That when we go through the, the trials and the sins and the mistakes of life, Jesus Christ is there pleading on our behalf, speaking on our behalf, believing on our behalf, working on our behalf. But he couldn't do that if he died and stayed in the grave. He could only do that because he lives. Because he always lives to make intercession for us. Ooh, that's good, that's good, that's good. Oh, hallelujah. Paul makes a statement in Romans the 8th chapter. If you got your Bible, turn with me to Romans in the 8th chapter. Paul makes a statement in Romans the 8th chapter. In the beginning of Romans the 8th chapter... Paul makes a statement, and then he continues on Romans in the 8th chapter, backing up that statement with doctrine of Jesus Christ. In Romans the 8th chapter, at the end, towards the end of Romans in the 8th chapter, in verse number 31, as Paul is backing up this statement, as he writes to the church in Rome, he says this, he says, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who could be against us? If God is for us, who could be against us? Remember we talked about gravity? You remember when we just talked about gravity, about, about a weightiness? This is one of those weightiness, all right? You got to get this. You got to shake it off. You know, come on. Think about it here. He's asking you a question. If God is for us, who? Who? can be against us. It goes on to say, verse number 32, if God is for us, who could be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him, Jesus Christ, also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? Remember we talked about Jesus making intercession. He is able to save those who come to God through him. Who can bring a charge against those who come to God through Christ? It is God who justifies. So he goes on to say, who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen and even at the right hand of God who also makes intercession for us. Who can bring a charge against those who come to God by way of Jesus Christ? Who can judge those who find God through Jesus Christ? Now I said Paul made it a statement. And then he backs it up. Let's go backwards in Romans the 8th chapter to Romans the 8th chapter. First verse. Put it up on the overhead, guys. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Paul says you don't live a life of condom. Now we can take that verse and, and, and go crazy with it. Oh, hallelujah, no condemnation. 
where's the bar? <laughs> but then he backs that statement up out of Romans, the eighth chapter, the entire thing. Because there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Jesus is our one and only. Jesus is the one that we stand on. Jesus has the ability or the power to save because he lives and Jesus is our intercessor. He is our mediator. So let me tell you something. There's a time when man is appointed to die and you will face the decisions and the actions for your life at judgment. You will. You can't escape it. You cannot escape it. All men will die at some point unless the Lord tarries and we're taken with him. But then we will stand before the throne of judgment and make an account for our life. And they'll throw the book at you. Every decision you've ever made, every, every mistake you've ever made, every bad word you've ever said. A couple of us have a, that's a big book. And there's a weight. And when the, ver when the verdict, when the gavel is about to come down because our lives were worthy of the death penalty, Jesus Christ, the Bible says, who's at the right hand of the Father, sits there as our intercessor. Jesus Christ is our great defense attorney. And as the gavel is about to come down on our judgment, Jesus says, hold on a minute. Hold on a minute. And he stands on our behalf, raises his hands to show the scars that we put in his hands to show that when we are in Christ, because he lives, he makes intercession for us. And he pleads our defense before eternity. And the condemnation that would once have sent us to hell because we deserved it is gone because there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. All because he lives. Did you guys get something out of the word of the Lord today? Give the Lord a great big praise. Hey, let me do one more thing today. Just give me a moment more of your attention, if you will. Please don't get up. Please don't walk around. Let me ask you something very, very, very important. You know, it'd be a tragedy for us to get together, to sing some songs, to hear the word of God and go home without giving you the opportunity to look into your life and determine whether or not, if you were to die, you would spend eternity with God in heaven. So let me ask you this question, a hypothetical question. If you were to walk out of this place and die, heaven forbid that be the case, but if that was the case, if you were to walk out of this place and die, would you find yourself in heaven or would you find yourself in hell? relatively simple question, but let's look at some of that. You know, you might say, Pastor Luke, I'm not sure that I believe in heaven. I'm not sure that I believe in God or hell or any of that stuff. Hey, listen, let me tell you something. I love you enough. I respect you enough. I honor you enough to tell you the truth and not play games or beat around the bush. You know, you're entitled to your belief and you're entitled to your, your thoughts, but at the same time, if they're wrong or they're deceiving, that's going to lead you in a place that you don't want to go. And let me tell you something. Heaven is real. Hell is a very real place. Real enough for God to mention it in his word, Jesus Christ to teach about it in his teachings. That's like saying maybe because you didn't hear about it, didn't know anything about it, that you, that you don't believe in Mack trucks yet. Go stand on the slow lane of the freeway and you'll meet one face to face because it's real. So let's quit playing games. Let's move forward with that. You know, you might say, well, Pastor, look, I hope I get to heaven. I sure want to go. I think I'm going to get there. If I died, I think so. You know, nowhere in the Word of God does it say that you can think your way into heaven. Nowhere in the Word of God does it say that because you hope you're going to get to heaven that you're going to get there. Or nowhere in the Word of God does it say that because you want to go to heaven, that God's going to look at you and say, well, you know, they wanted it bad enough, I'm going to let them in. You're not going to get to heaven that way. You can't get it. You won't find that anywhere in the Word of God. Hey, did you know you can't get to heaven because you weren't raised as a Buddhist, a Hindu, or a Muslim, or any other type of world religion? So by default, that makes you a Christian and you're going to get into heaven? You're not going to find that in the Word of God. You can't get to heaven by default or classification. Not going to find it. Not going to get there that way. Do you know you can't get to heaven because your parents took you to church as a baby? because you were christened or baptized or because you went to Sunday school or Sabbath school or catechism classes? Did you know you can't get to heaven because your parents told you as a child or growing up that you were a Christian because you went to church on Christmas and on Easter or because you're here today? No in the Word of God does it say that because you sit in church, warm a chair, listen to somebody speak, that you're going to get into heaven. 
There's more to it than that. Nowhere in the Word of God does it say that because your parents told you you were a Christian that you're going to get into heaven. Nowhere in the Bible will you find that because you attended Sunday school or Sabbath school classes or christened as a baby that you're going to get into heaven. You're not going to find it there. Why? Because there's more to it than that. And we'll talk about it in just a moment. Hey, did you know you can't get to heaven because you're a good person? Because you've never cheated on your taxes? Because you don't drive too fast on the, on the freeway? Because you, you give to charitable organizations? Because you've done more good in your life than bad? Did you know you can't get to heaven? As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us that our good deeds, according to God, are like filthy rags. Nothing we could ever do on our own would ever make us good enough to get into heaven. Why? Because there's more than just the outside actions. Yes, our actions are important, but here's the truth, is that it's God's heaven... The only way to get into God's heaven is God's way, and that way is Jesus Christ. And Jesus says this, he says that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man goes to the Father except through him. So you can't get to heaven your way, you can't get to heaven my way, or some well-meaning author or church committee's way. The only way you and I can find ourselves in heaven for eternity is God's way, and that's through Jesus Christ. A man by the name of Nicodemus comes to Jesus and they have this discussion about eternal, eternity. And, and Jesus says an interesting statement to the man named Nicodemus. The Bible tells us that Nicodemus was a Pharisee or a leader of the Jews. Nicodemus was a religious leader of his day. He, he had memorized the scripture. He sang the scripture. He gave to the poor. He did all the right things. He wore all the right clothes. He had the stature in the community. And Jesus, as they're talking about eternal life, looks at Nicodemus. And you would think that Jesus would say to Nicodemus, you just keep on going. You're on the right way. But Jesus says to Nicodemus, you must be born again. What does born again mean? You've heard that term through popular culture, society, Hollywood's dragged it through the coals. But you know what? I don't care what Hollywood makes of it. I don't care what popular culture makes of it. Born again from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible has always, always, always meant the same thing in the eyes of God. And it means this, that you've given God all of your heart. You've given God all of your life. Hey, everybody look at me. Look at me. Look at me. God is not after your mental ascent towards him. God's not after your carnal knowledge of who he is. You can't get to heaven because you know who Jesus Christ is. You couldn't go anywhere in America probably without fight, asking somebody and they know who Jesus is. But because they know who Jesus is doesn't mean that they're born again. The Bible tells us that the devil in hell and the demons in hell know who Jesus is. The Bible tells us that the devil and, the, and hell and the demons in hell know the scriptures. The devil quoted the scriptures to Jesus in the time of the wilderness. Yet he's not on his way to heaven. Because it's not about your mental ascent towards God. It's not about your carnal knowledge or the fact that you can memorize John 3, 16 or a few other verses. There's more to it than that, and that's to give him all of your heart, all of your life. You see, it's an all or nothing relationship with God. Let me prove it to you. In the Bible, in the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible, Jesus Christ is speaking to the church, people like you and I, gathered together doing good things in the name of Jesus, and he says to them, I know your works. And when I come back, I better find you hot or I better find you cold. Because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. And what Jesus Christ is saying is that lukewarm Christians are not real Christians at all and will be rejected and ejected from the kingdom of God. Well, what does lukewarm mean? Let me say it to you like this. In terms of your relationship, lukewarm, you think about in our, in our, our modern day vernacular, lukewarm is like a, a warm soda on a hot day. It just doesn't do the job. Lukewarm in the terms of your relationship with Jesus Christ is a little bit in and a little bit out. Your relationship a little bit up and a little bit down. Occasional church attendance, you're kind of floating around, doing some of your own thing, doing some of God's thing. You haven't gone wholehearted for God. You're not wholehearted opposed for God. You're riding the fence right down the middle. And Jesus Christ says, if that's you, you are deceived in thinking you're going to make it into, into heaven. So then how do we get there? We talked about this, it's God's heaven and the only way to get there is God's way. And Jesus Christ said that he is the way, the truth, and the life. So let's not do it any other way but God's way. And here's what I'm going to do in a moment. I want to give you the opportunity to ensure your place with God, with Jesus Christ, in heaven for eternity. Hey, forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. Don't miss out on this opportunity. Here's what I'm going to do in a moment. I'm going to count to three. I'm going to go one, two. I'm going to count to three. I'm going to go bang. I'm going to smack my hand on my Bible just like that, real loud. Bang. When I smack my hand on the Bible, I want to give you the opportunity. And I want to, what I want you to do is, if that's you in this place, I want you to pop your hand up. And what you're doing by the raising of your hand when I smack my hand on the Bible is you're saying, Pastor Luke, I want to go forward in my relationship with Jesus Christ. I want to give him all of my heart. I want to give him all of my life. I acknowledge that I need Jesus Christ as my Lord and as my Savior. And I want to do that today. 
I'll see your hand, I'll acknowledge it, put it right back down. You say, Pastor Luke, I don't know if I can raise my hand. I think I'm going to be embarrassed. The person that I came with or the person sitting next to me is going to know where I'm at. Hey, listen, you might be embarrassed. Hey, you probably will be, but get over it today. Wouldn't it be better to spend a moment of embarrassment than an eternity in hell because you couldn't go forward for Jesus Christ and confess him? The Bible tells us Jesus Christ says that if you confess him before men, he'll confess you before his Father. But if you deny him before men, he'll deny you before his Father. You see, the decision's yours. God's not a manipulator. He's not a conniver. He's already done everything he could to make sure to get, to get you to the place to get into heaven. And all you've got to do is give him all of your heart and give, you, give him all of your life. You see, God gave his everything for you, Jesus Christ, to die a beaten, bloody mess on the cross to take your sins. And in return, he wants your everything for him. It's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, who should raise their hands? If you've never given your heart, you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, in just a moment, if that's you, from the front to the back, if you're watching by way of television in the foyer, or if you're in the family room, in just a moment, if that's you, get your hand up. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it. We'll all do it together. We'll get it all. Hold on, sister. I see you right there. We're going to do it in just a moment. Hands are already getting to go up. Who should get their hands up? If you're not, not sure, maybe you did it in a Billy Graham crusade or a Harvest crusade, but you never followed through, don't walk out of this place without making sure today. That's a gamble on your eternal life you can't afford to make. Finally, who should get their hand up today? If you've been living lukewarm, doing your own thing instead of God's thing, get your hand up today and let's go forward for Jesus Christ and ensure your place with God in heaven forever, leaving hell behind. It wasn't created for you, wasn't designed for you, and it's not God's intention for you. Why? Because Jesus Christ is able to save to the uttermost. All you've got to do is give him your heart, give him your life. The decision's yours. If that's you in this place, get ready. Hands are getting ready to go up all over this place. If that's you, let's, let's go forward. Today is the day of your salvation. Don't walk out of this place without making sure. Let's go forward for God in this place. It'll be the best day of your life, I guarantee you. All across this auditorium, here we go. Hands getting ready to go up. If that's you, get ready. Here we go. Ready? One, two, three. Let me see your hands in the house today. I saw you right there. Two, three, I, that's three, where are you at? Four, I see you right there. Four wise people. Anybody else in the house today? I see hands, uh, uh, five, I see you back there. Six, I see you right there. Six wise people, seven, eight, nine, ten, I got you. Eleven, twelve, I see you. Twelve wise people, anybody else? I see an usher pointing over this direction. Where are you at? Give me, oh, 13, 14, wow, praise God. Fourteen wise people. Where are you at? You guys are kind of pointing over in this direction. I got you already, sister, you can put your hand. 14 wise people. Anybody else in the house today? Say, I want to give my heart. I want to give my life. I see you. I see you right there. Six, 15. Praise God. 15 wise people. Anybody else? Hey, I'm going to close this up. This is your opportunity. Don't walk out. Come on. You say, man, I wonder if I should. Hey, you should. I see people. Oh, we're, oh, I was about to count you. 16. I see you, my friend. 16 wise people. 17 wise people. Praise God. Look at you guys. Spirit of God's on this place. The Bible says that it's the goodness of God that draws men to repentance. It's not about me. It's about Jesus Christ. Come on, answer the call. If that's you, number 18, number 19, number 20, got that butterflies in your stomach, say, man, I wonder if I should come on. That's the call of Jesus on you right now. Today is the day of your salvation. Anybody else, don't miss this opportunity today. Don't walk out of this place saying, I wish I would have. Anybody else today? Anybody else today? 17 wise people. Hey, I didn't embarrass them. I'm not going to embarrass you. 18, I see. Anybody else? Spirit of God's in this place. 18 wise people. Well, praise God for 18 wise people. Hallelujah. <laughs> Woo! Listen, here's what I want to do. For those of you that raised your hand, hey, for 19, number 20, that you didn't raise your hand, you kind of, man, did I miss it? No, you didn't miss it. Here's what we're going to do. In a moment, we're all going to stand together. They're going to sing a song. And you said you want to give them all your heart. You said you want to give them all your life. Hey, listen, you're not too old. You're not too young. If you raise your hand and you're serious about this, let us help you. Let us pray for you. Don't get saved by raising your hand. You say, I want to, I, I want to do that. Let us help you. Let us pray with you. Let us get some things in your hands to get you strong in the ways of the Lord. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to be bold. If you raise your hand and you're serious about this, I want you to grab your coat, your sweater, your purse, your Bible, a friend if you need a friend, somebody that came with you and asked them, come on, will you go with me and get out of your seat, get out of your chair as we all stand together and come and meet me at the altar and let's change destinies together. So why don't we all stand if that's you. If you raise your hand, you come on, come on, come on up here if that's you. If you're serious about this, you come on from the front to the back, wherever you're at. If that's you, come on, you can come. Lord, I give you my heart, I give you my soul. You can come, come on, if that's you. I'll live come on. for you alone, every 
breath that I you take. You can come, come on. Every moment I'm away. From the front to the back, from the family Lord, rooms, that was you. Come on. We'll wait for you. In me. Lord, I give you my heart. I give you my soul. I got to give it to you. We'll wait for you. Come on. If you're coming, we'll wait for you. It's okay. I got to give it to you guys. Man, you rush the stage. That's hunger. Hey, it's a good day. Hey, listen, you're not going to a funeral. You're going to a birthday celebration. Today is the first day of the rest of your life. Here's what I want to do. I want to introduce a friend of mine to you. This is Pastor Joel. Like Noel, Joel. All right, Pastor Joel is a really cool guy. He's going to take you right over there. Nothing weird goes on. I'm as weird as it gets. I promise you that. <laughs> Nothing weird goes on. He's going to lead you in a prayer. You don't get saved by raising your hand. You get saved by asking Jesus Christ to be the Lord and Savior of your life. He's going to give you some free literature, some things uh, that our senior pastor, Pastor Jim, wrote to help you get strong in the ways of the Lord. Easy reading. Very simple reading. And then he's going to introduce something that we have to, for you called Spiritual Personal Trainers. We give away friends here at the Rock Church World Art Center by the names of Spiritual Personal Trainers. You know, you go to the gym, you get a personal trainer, they make sure that you're lifting the weights and doing the, things the right way so that you don't waste your time at the gym. We have Spiritual Personal Trainers, a friend, somebody that will meet with you right before service, buy you a cup of coffee, teach you some things about the Word of the Lord for five weeks to get you strong in the ways of the Lord so you don't go back to the life that you came from and that you start moving forward in your relationship with Christ. And let me do this. Let me ask you one thing. I know it's a lot to take in. It's okay. One thing. I want to ask you, you're serious about this, to give God one year of your life, 12 months, sitting under the word right here at the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. Why? Because this is where the Spirit of the Lord spoke to you. You say, Pastor, look, I have a church. That's great. We love your church. And I'm not trying to pull you out of your church, but what I am saying to you is that if you have a church, and you would have gone there tonight and died. You might have gone to hell. But today, the Spirit of the Lord spoke to you. And I promise, I promise, if you spend 12 months here at the Rock Church and World Outreach Center listening to the Word and getting it into your heart, I promise you, guarantee, you'll never be the same. Am I lying? Give God a chance today. Would you guys go right over there with Pastor Joel? Woo!